Ron Holden Jr. take one. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of Behind the Lens. Today we have a very special guest, a creative founder, everything, just a whole umbrella of different creativity, Ron Holden Jr. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited just to hear of everything you have going on, you do so much good in the community, very creative person. And um, I actually met Ron, I think it was 2019, maybe 2018, I don't even remember oh, now. 18. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was um, art directing for a pop up museum here in Los Angeles that one of my friends had like some clothing in, but super glad we connected and just have stayed connected throughout the last couple of years. So I'm excited to just chop it up with you, man. So thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. You know, we're just all trying to be as cool and creative as you. So you continue <laughs> to inspire us all. Every day. It's not, it's not I bad. appreciate being here with you. <laughs> no, no doubt but yeah today's all about you so we want to you know dive right into it and you know the first question that i like to ask my guests are just tell us a little bit about your background you know like how you got started um in the creative field just where you're from all that good stuff my mom lived in inglewood and lamert um my dad lived in like pico la brea area and then um you know i just grew up as a sports kid um i wasn't really i didn't take like creativity pretty, I didn't take creativity seriously, to be honest, until like later on in life, which is, this is weird. But, um, so yeah, like my mom moved to Palmdale my freshman year of high school. So she moved me up to high school, to Palmdale, you know, in for high school, with the Highland High School. Um, and then like, you know, again, just school and sports. After school, after high school, I went to like a junior college and I was doing like this firefighting thing. I played basketball at Valley College and then I um, and then I went to go be an EMT as I was working as a uh, at like as like a production assistant at um, at a, a creative agency called Optimus. Optimus does a lot here in L.A. They've been around for years. They've got uh, offices all over the the globe at this point now um but like um it was weird because i was set on being a firefighter so i was working emt and then during you know the, my off days i was working at this creative agency it was like polar opposites to be doing um but i'm so thankful for it because like without being introduced to the agency and like just being thrown into that world i would have never picked up a camera i would have never you know, learned how to like make, you know, apparel. I would have never learned how, like anything creative, I would have never been introduced to it. So like this, this conversation would have never happened and everything I do now would have never happened if I was never introduced. So it's been a blessing. Um, and you never know what happens. Like all it takes is one opportunity to, to change your direct your trajectory. Um, so it's been an amazing experience thus far. We're still learning every day, obviously. I think, you know, we're, all, we're always, always students, you know, as, as long as we live. For, so uh, otherwise, yeah. like, what are we really doing if we're not learning every day? But right. a, couple exactly. of things I, a couple of things I want to learn more because a lot, a lot of this is the first time I'm hearing this because we've only, like, chopped it up about creative stuff. So talk yeah, to me yeah. about, first, let's start with the sports. So were you, like, you played, you played junior college ball. Were you trying to, like, go D1? Was that, like, sort of your initial childhood dream? Or, like, did you want to be in the NBA? What was yeah, that like? Yeah, man. I mean, I feel like every kid that plays sports wanted to be in the NFL or the NBA. I love sports. I love football more than basketball growing up. Um, <clears throat> um, but because I moved to Palmdale in high school, like, it was too hot to play football. I wasn't going to no hell week. I wasn't practicing in 100 degrees. So, like, I just, like, let it go. And I played basketball at high school. Um, pretty, pretty good level, like. Um, I definitely had some like D1 scholarships. Unfortunately, I wasn't the best student. So like those just slipped through, you know, so it is what it is. Um, and then like, and then some of the schools that I did have opportunities to go to, I didn't want to move to like Arizona or like, uh, fucking Seattle or I just didn't want to leave LA at that point. I was really boxed in, like I was in a box and like, not like willing to explore which you know 
I encourage every child to always explore, go away from home, like go to college somewhere different, go travel as much as you can when you have the opportunity, um, because that it, those experiences help you expand as an individual, as a human, and it helps your mind grow too, because you're now going to be introducing yourself to things that you would have never seen or ran into, which um, <clears throat> which experience in itself is the best teacher. Um, but yeah, so like, whatever, I just didn't do it, kind of gave up on sport. Uh, then I went to Valley College because they were one of the only community colleges that offered uh, a firefighting degree, like fire science. So I was like, okay, like I'll go there because I just do the firefighting thing and then like call it a day. Um, and then when I got there, um, like my uncle or something knew like some of the basketball coaches there. And he was like, yo, you have to go play basketball. So just go. I already told them. So I was like, all right, whatever. I go. I play two years there. Um, and then after that, like I just jumped into um Again, like I kind of was like over it, over sports after high school, and I was just doing it to do it so that it kept me like focused while I was at college. So, um, and then after that, you know, I just stayed athletic, but like just focused on work um, and um, and like the EMT firefighting thing. And uh, so, sports was huge, man. Sports, I lived and breathed sports. I love sports. Um, I think sports are like such an instrumental part of like growth for 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 kids because you know it's the idea of like you know working with others working with a team not being the only one depending on other people as well but also knowing that people are depending on you um and like getting to like experience like so many different people from so many different walks of life so um you know it's it was uh it's definitely what's created who i am now because of like that uh, willingness to compete and um, and like just be better every time, um, which is something you had to do you know playing sports at any level. So um, yeah, man, sports are tight. Now I'm riding bikes. Yeah, of course, and we'll definitely get into to the whole bike riding here in a little bit. But talk to me about um, your first experience with with a camera. So. I know your main focus isn't photography, but you do do photography. You have done photography. You're a really good photographer, done amazing projects. So walk me through, you know, just that experience of working in an agency. And then like, what, what was like the moment where it's like you picked up a camera and you're like, oh, like this could be something that I want to get into. Yeah. Well, that's interesting where um, I feel like I bought my first camera in like 2011 and I'd never, besides like a, you know, one of those little like Polaroid cameras, disposable cameras. I never touched a camera before then. So like the first two weeks, I couldn't understand why my photo was black and it was daylight because I didn't know how to do my settings. So like, it was just like weird. So like, it was a weird thing and it took me like a year to like kind of understand how the camera worked, right? And I remember it was a Canon T2i. I'm sure a lot of people have started on that camera. Um, but like, again, like me being introduced to Optimus and under, and like me working closely on like all the Nike projects, my eyes just started to like open up and like my like subconscious just started to absorb like all the creative opportunities that like I would never, I was never really exposed to or, um, or like even knew of, right? So like, um, so like it kind of like really just like lit a fire in me to like want to tap into the creative side of my brain, which was again, like it's just a blessing in disguise because um, like I also got to learn how to shoot and how to work in a creative space from like an award-winning creative agency and also doing that work for Nike, right? So like some of my first projects were like not huge, but like, you know, a couple years in, I'm like shooting, I'm getting paid by Nike to shoot stuff, which is tight for any, like that's anyone's dream, right? So it was like, it was a, it was definitely the universe putting me in the right space at the right time. And like me kind of being prepared as well, you know? Um, so it's, uh, 
it's a blessing. You never know what you're going to walk into. But I definitely, because, like, I even went to, after I picked up the camera and, like, started getting, like, really small gigs, I went to Art Institute to get, like, a bachelor's in uh, digital photography. Um, that didn't last long because I learned very quickly that I learned way more at the agency than I did at the school, which is probably why Art Institute in itself always has been in like some kind of a controversial conversation. Because like I remember my second year there, my lighting teacher, she that was the worst class experience ever. But and I, there's so many stories to say about this. Wait, break it down. Break it. I want to hear about this this class though. But I'm gonna just give you one. Okay. I'm gonna give you two yeah. actually. Two, All right, two. go for it. Go for it. One one day she takes us outside. She's like, "Yo, we're gonna work on, you know, shooting outside with flash. Cool, like a like a hot shoe flash. All right, cool. Let's do it." And she's like struggling to do what she's trying to show us. So I'm like, "Okay, whatever." So. Like, we don't do anything. We're outside and it just doesn't work, so we go back inside, right? So, like, that's, like, that was, like, the first week. I'm, like, well, cool, whatever. Maybe she's having a bad day. Next week, she brings in, um, uh, like, a pro photo kit. And she's, like, all right, we're going to learn. We're going to work on, you know, studio lighting, da, 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 da. And, like, again, she can't set up the lights. She can't get it right. She can't. For execute what she's trying to get us to learn and then she literally says oh well you know what you guys can just google it youtube it for your homework and like you'll be able to figure it out and i was like what you just told us everyone in here is paying all kinds of dollars to be in this school and you just told us to youtube how to do the homework assignment you told us to do that makes no sense so at that point, I was just like, yo, I'm out of here. Like, I'm just going to be at, this, at the agency more. And I'm just going to, you know, absorb, absorb there. We have the same, you know, we have all the same equipment. And I have people that are there that are willing to show me and guide me, like, that have done amazing work already. So why pay all this money? Now I'm, in, now I'm paying off student loans for a class where the lighting teacher can show me how to set up some lights. <laughs> that's, that's a struggle, man. That Yeah, I would be so upset and so pissed. Like, it's like, what is the point of all this? And that's interesting too, because I, I get a lot of people like that reach out to me and it's like, oh, is like film school worth it or whatever, like photography type of education. It's like, I don't know. It's like, for me, it's really hard to like uh, promote or like be like, yeah, go to film school. Cause I didn't go to film school. Like I majored in economics. I literally bought a camera in like 2015, 2016 learned everything on YouTube and learned by doing. And I think that's like one of the biggest things because with like photography, videography, it's like so subjective, like beauty's in the eye of the beholder. Obviously you don't want to put out trash content, but like you just learn by doing, I feel like at the end of the day. And it's just like, um, yeah, it's just like you, you have to do it and, and get practice in. Otherwise you're really not going to learn just by like sitting there and like taking in theory, I feel like, but that's just my perspective. I don't know. Everyone's, yeah, a, little bit, it, everyone's um, a little bit different. No. I feel you because I went to art school and like not to say that it's like one of the most prestigious art schools, but either way, like you just never know what you're going to take away from school. Right. Um, because it, there's so many variables in that, especially when the creative field, because like you think of like some of the classes of like, you know, introductions to digital photography. So like it talked about like, the basics of the camera and how to work it, you know, your stops, like, you know, like the basics, what ISO means as opposed to shutter speed and how it differentiates, like, the light that you get, right? Like those little technical things, which are good for someone to show you, but you can still learn on YouTube, right? But like outside of that, I didn't really learn anything else. Like, you know, like my favorite class was art theory. So like, you know, that's one class of two years of school that I actually enjoyed. Um, and like, uh, actually, business of photography was a good class. But again, you can nowadays just YouTube that. We're just understanding how the business works, um, which is, you know, key. Um, but like, yeah, a lot of people ask me sometimes too, like, you know, what, what should I do? That I'm like, my thing is like, you just got to go take photos. You just got to go do it. Because... 
the biggest thing is like, sure, I can tell you that real quick about like how to use your camera on manual, which we should all be doing, right? But like after that, like it's up to you. Like, like it's the same thing as like a painter. Like a painter would go to art school and you know they learn, you know, theory and they learn the technique. But like after that is when you as an artist come out. Um, and no one can like make your eye and no one can like really fine tune like how you see things. So I feel like it's, it's a, the idea of art in itself comes from like how you perceive and how you execute things and like what you want to do and, and the stories you want to tell. So like it's kind of up to you on that point. Like no one else can really hold your hand after that. And one thing I want to like pick your brain on is just like, I think with social media, like, Instagram, TikTok, whatever, like does a great job of glamorizing, like being a freelancer, being like you're, you're traveling, you're shooting all these campaigns, yada, yada, yada. But the fact of the matter is like the majority of these people are either shooting for free, they're not really getting the rate that they want, or they're just kind of doing it for the quote unquote exposure. So don't be yeah. fooled by what Instagram has to show you. But I want to get your take because yeah. you, you, you ended up take you ended up going the agency route. Um, and, and working, you know, a full-time job, like were, were you brought on as a photographer? Was it just more so like an entry-level position? And then they kind of like introduced you into the creative field, into all these different relationships and, and people that you've been able to work with. My path is very unique, I think. Um, but yeah, I was at the agency. I kind of learned everything from them. Um, and then there was this fork in the road while I was at the agency and learning photography still. And the fork was, hey, you can go to Seattle and, like, go join the Seattle Fire Department as an opening. Or I can move to Vegas and run a sneaker store called Crossover at the Cosmo with my friends and make the same amount of money. So at 23, I moved to Vegas. I left the agency. I go run a sneaker store for about a year. Again, working on my, my art and, like, my, my photography, like, using that using the platform of crossover as a way to like practice and continue to grow and also network. And I met a lot of, you know, some of my best friends I met in that time, that time frame too. Um, and then I came, then I left Vegas and Vegas is crazy. Like you don't need to spend more than a weekend out there. And I spent the year. So, um, so I moved back to LA and when I come back to LA, the, the agency was like, yo, like you can jump back in wherever you want. And they're like, we have a lot of shoots coming up and like, we could probably use you to shoot a lot more. And at that point I kind of just went, um, I went more freelance. So like essentially like I had such a great relationship with the agency, both because of my work ethic and you know the time I put in there, but also I worked on my craft outside of them, and they realized that and they trusted me. Um, so it worked out to my benefit to where like I didn't have to work the agency hours anymore. I didn't have to be on the production for 20 hours in a day. Like at this point now, I could just come and shoot the event or shoot the project or da 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 da, da and then go home and edit. And um, when you start to calculate the dollar and time spent, it starts to make a lot more sense, right? Um, so like, yeah, it, it's, it's weird, but like I was kind of blessed with like this layup because I put the work in and because I worked on the relationship, I had worked on it for years, obviously. Um, and I understood, again, because I learned from the agency and working with the, with the um with the brands that we were working with, like I learned from them. So they knew that I knew what they wanted to see and how they wanted to see it. Um, and, um, and again, like, I don't know, it's just perfect, man. Like I, if you would have asked me when I was 20, if I would be doing any of that, I would have said no. Cause I was like, I don't even know how to use a camera. So I don't know what you're talking about. The creative industry is just so, like you, you mentioned, like you feel like you have a unique path, but I, I feel like a lot of people do, you know, there's really no linear trajectory. Like people started out in finance who are now like renowned photographers, whatever. So every, every, yeah, I think like for anyone watching this, like it's a re good reminder to be like, just because you're doing something right now, you want to be a photographer, a creative, like doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, something I wanted to learn about you is because it seems like you know, you, you had the, the preparation and the opportunity that presented itself where you were able to take advantage of that. So I think that just comes from like a instilled 
work ethic that I'm sure you learned at a very young age where you're just like, I'm just going to keep grinding and doing what I have to do. Um, so like, what advice would you have for anyone who's watching who might be like in the middle of nowhere, Nebraska, who feels like they need to be out in one of these big cities and that's the only way they can make it. But like, what is something, some action items that you feel like they can do right now that can help prepare them for when an opportunity presents itself, whatever it might be? That's an interesting question. Cause like, <clears throat> like you said, and not, not every, no two paths are going to be alike ever, right? Um, and, like, yes, like you said, social would sell you on a lot. And, like, if you are somewhere in the middle of nowhere, and you feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, and you're seeing every, everything you want to do is you see it, like, somewhere else, like, nowhere close to you, there is something to be said about that. And there is something to be said about being close to the energy and, like, you know, that's why people move to L.A. or New York or you know, whatever, Chicago, they like be in those industries or be closer. But the idea that like, you, you know, we saw this past year, actually, like this past year shrunk our world a lot. So like at this point, it don't matter if you're in, if, if you're in Indiana and you're doing good work and you're doing a good job at like putting your work out there and, um, being a good human being when you like work with people like that inevitably will um, work itself out. I feel like, I feel like to be honest, like the biggest thing is like obviously doing really good work so you can do that from, from wherever you are. Um, but also being a better human because the better of a human you are, the longer your career will be. And and um, for me, like, for instance, like, I never really had a website until, like, later on in my career. And I never made a business card. Like, I still don't have a business card, ever. And, like, and, like I didn't, like, cold call people. I didn't cold email brands or people. Like, every single job that I pretty much ever got was because it was referral and I hope that's because my work was good and because I was a good person to the people that I've worked with before. And like, you never know, like you might shoot something for someone in Wyoming and that person moves somewhere else and does whatever. And now they're like, yo, we got to use him. This guy that I worked with back home, he's better than everyone and he's a good person. And I think he deserves the opportunity. Um, I mean, and then the other side too is like, again, digital, a digital, the digital world we live in now, like you can put a website out, you can, you know, hit up people, cold call, email, but you got to do it in the right way too. You can't, you got to like really practice on like writing and like being kind of like, um, not like overly aggressive, but like kind of like humble sometimes too. Cause even I get hit up by some people we're like looking for questions or answers or want to work with me or whatever. And it's just like, unfortunately, because you're, we're in this digital space and I don't necessarily, we're not necessarily meeting face to face. Like the energy you come with and the get go can turn people off sometimes because, you know, they're protective of the work that they're doing too. So like, you just got to understand like how to talk to people, how to approach people, um, so that you can like kind of be relatable and like make people feel comfortable if you're looking to like really break into some new people or make some new connections too. But at the end of the day, good work, good being a good human and like being consistent. Cause like if I want to find a good photographer, I can find you anywhere at this point. Yeah. It's a simple search of a hashtag on Instagram and you're yeah. literally in, inundated with a bunch of people. But yeah, I think being, yeah. being a good, person is like such an underrated trait and i know like people say it a lot i feel just like i've heard it through different messaging but it's just like so instrumental in just like in your career path in general regardless of if you're a photographer creative or not like just being a good person because a is just the right thing to do like i think just at a fundamental human level being kind is like so important to anyone but yeah again like when it comes to like your business and what you want to do like you really don't know what person is going to end up where like the industry becomes smaller and smaller the more you get into it and like everyone knows everyone so it's like really easy for the word 
to get around and it's like, hey, like, you know, Saul, like, he's kind of a dick last time. Like, let's not hire him because, like, it's just not worth it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just being difficult to work with. Luckily, I've never had yeah. that said, said about me that I know of. So um, to try to keep it that way. Yeah, but, yeah, man. I doubt anyone would ever say that to you about you. So I, I hope you're safe. <laughs> cool. But yeah, I appreciate that. But <laughs> circling back to um, just like your, your career path and your trajectory. Um, so when you, when you got back from Vegas, what, what year would you say that was? Uh, like 2014. Okay. So we're in 2014 and, and we met in 2018. So how do we, how do you get from, you know, Ron working at this agency, you know, doing photography and shoots in-house to, you know, doing, doing art direction for like pop-up museums and, and, and things of that nature. Man, I, that's crazy. I don't even know, but, um, <laughs> So like I went freelance and I just focused on photography and like just getting better. Um, and like, again, when, when I go back to, I say like, you know, doing good work, being a good human and being consistent. Right. So like I consistently worked on photography. Like if I, if you want to be good at something, like you have to live and breathe it. Um, especially when no one knows you. So like in my case too, like I wasn't like, a lot of the stuff I was doing, sometimes I wouldn't even be able to, you know, show or like post or anything. So like a good, like at least half of the work I've ever done in my life, I've never been able to show sometimes. So with that being said, you have to, I had to be on my grind even more because I have to always deliver and I gotta always, you know, um, like be consistent, but also not focus on what other people are doing. So like, like you said, like social can be like a distraction and you feel like, ah, oh, I'm falling behind. I don't have all the followers and da, 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 da. It's just like, well, you're working and your bank account says that you're working. So like, you know, like you got to even those things out too and understand like what you're doing it for, right? So are you doing it to be like, and my thing is like, I was doing it because I fell in love with it and I enjoyed my life, like my live, my work life balance was tight because like I could work when I want to. I could not that I was rich, but like I could pay my bills and eat and, you know, survive and, you know, do all the, all the things that I wanted to do um, by using my creativity. Right. So that's a you know, that's a blessing. Um, so like I just focused on like getting better every day, investing back into my equipment or myself or my like education like you know just with time like you said like spending hours on youtube learning like new tips or new tricks or like how to like edit this or like you know anytime i ran into a question i'd just dive into youtube for five hours to like figure it out right um and and that's just that work ethic where like it kind of helped me keep going i got again and then i started getting introduced to a couple more people so like my guy Brandon and Matt who used to be at finish line and they kind of like were ramping, like ramping up like content and social for finish line at that moment. Um, and like, to be honest, it was a blessing. Cause like I kind of turned into like the LA photographer for finish line social, which helped the energy. I got to meet more people. I got to practice more. Um, <clears throat> and then again, still doing Nike stuff and, you know, all the way back to like, you know, I've shot, it's crazy because I've shot like, you know, stuff with like, you know, events or like campaign stuff or like fuel band, Nike fuel band, like Nike basketball, Nike running. Um, I've been able to shoot with like, you know, KD, Russell, Kobe, um, like all kinds of people, right? And um, so like, I just kept rolling with the flow and like being consistent, showing up, putting in good work, being a good person and like actually like loving what I'm doing, but also keeping it the focus because it's it's easy to like get caught into, you know, the vibe and like kind of like lose focus and feel like, oh, I made it. So we're good. Like so. Um, so I kept shooting um, and then. With my agency background, like. And shooting Nike, like, you know, the perception outside of that is like, whoa, like, you're big time. And, like, even, like, some of some of my buddies that I know at Nike who would, like, you know, go to a different company, it's like, oh, he came from Nike, so, like, it's legit. So, like, Nike kind of, like, just catapulted me and, my, and made my conversations easier because it's just like, oh, well, like, 
he shot, you know, whatever. And I kind of didn't really have to like, it sounds weird. I didn't have to like sell myself because I was a super humble, low key dude who just showed up and did the work. Right. So like that, that worked out, you know, for a good amount of years. And like, I grew my, my business grew, um, and my skills continued to grow and my network continued to grow. And then I started expanding into like more mediums of creativity, meaning like, you know, uh, at one point I was a little, I was, uh, helping like mag park with like all their apparel and like doing all their designs. And like, again, all these tools and, and skills I learned at the agency, um, that were like, you know, self-taught and then like nourished by the creatives that I was working, you know, shoulder to shoulder with. Um, and then I started getting into like experiential and like digital marketing, right? So like, you know, I helped a couple buddies, like I helped a buddy do like a sneaker release for their Nike Air Force One with um, um, Emotionally Unavailable. And then a buddy of mine knew um, the Cheat Day Land crew and they were like, yo, like, yo, do you have like some people that can help? And I was then, you know, again, all just referral, good people, good energy. And it's like, yo, this dude does everything, which sometimes people just introduce me as that. Like this guy does everything, which makes it awkward sometimes. Like I don't do everything. I do a few things, but you just can't, they're not all the same. But like, that's kind of a buddy, like my buddy Zoe introduced me to them. And, and that, and that crew at TJ land was super tight. And like, um, again, like I've, worked on all kinds of events for Nike and Jordan and you know so, like I understood the idea of like experience in an event and how to create like the continuity between the two right for something that lasted so long so it was a uh, again the universe just bringing me to the right crossroads for me to make the decision and, and execute so it was a good opportunity man um, it's a it was a blessing that was a fun time it's crazy. Yeah, I bet. And dude, that was a great, like, I think, spark notes, but so in-depth version of just like your career path. And it's just, like inspiring to hear that. And I'm sure like a lot of people starting out can just like relate to that. And just, I think the biggest takeaway is just really consistency. Like, even if you feel like you're making no progress, small progress is still progress. And it'll get you one step closer to wherever you're trying to be. So consistency is always the key in whatever you're trying to do. Um, before we wrap up this first half of the interview, um, I wanted to quickly touch upon uh, love you so and ride for black lives we're going to talk a little bit more in depth yeah. uh, in the second half but yeah just wanted to first start off with um love you so love you so is your clothing line passion project you design it talk, talk us uh through how that came about yeah love you so is interesting because like it's it's a so love you so is actually my grandfather's album from 1960 so he released the album in 1960 and Love Soul was like a pretty, he's like a one hit wonder vibe. So like the song was did well that year for a little while. And like, but the gesture of Love You So in itself meant a lot for our family, right? So like, um, it's just something I always heard. Like, yeah, you know, obviously I wasn't around in 1960 to hear the song. So like, I only heard Love You So from like my grandma or my grandpa or my, my dad and like my my uncles and stuff and like it turned into like this family mantra that like that's how we signed cards and like that's how we like signature emails and like that's what we text each other right and like for me I was just looking for like a different outlet for like my creativity and not necessarily like trying to do like a clothing line but like just like um like uh I refer to it as like like the studio that creates creative hugs, meaning I've done prints before. So like just for my photos, but I also do like some hoodies or some tees or whatever every now and then. Right. And like, it's just like this creative hug that like, you know, you never know next month I might do a rug and next month I might do um, a coffee mug or whatever. Right. So it's like this, it's like this just, this free creative experience that I get to like do whatever I want and hopefully um, people, you know, respond to it well, but most importantly, it's more about spreading like positive messages. Um, 
with whatever medium I use, right? So like fashion is tight, streetwear is tight. Obviously I've been around it for so long with like what I've been doing. Um, but I feel like there's been a space, um, there's been a lane of like positive, like purposeful positive messaging within streetwear and fashion. And like, that's kind of like what Love You So is. It's, it exudes like, you know, just a creative, but um, positive and loving lifestyle. You feel me? So yeah. that's what that is. Yeah. So, no doubt. And we're, we're, we're both rocking some of the products. Yeah, man, I, got I the, appreciate I got the you. long sleeve. You got the green hoodie, which I'm waiting on. The hoodie, which, the uh, hoodie which is I'm, coming soon. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people are waiting on no, but I've, I've seen, I, 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 I was one of those people that literally was like hounding Rod. Was like, when is this dropping? Like, I need it. I'm just like, I'm just like, I appreciate it. I was supposed <laughs> to drop them in December, and I didn't drop them until March, just because life's been crazy, you know. Of course, um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, but, the, been, but they're so, here. Right. Go ahead. They're here. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming <laughs> for sure. And speaking of. Speaking of life getting crazy, wanted to again briefly because we'll get into it a little bit more in the second half. But just yeah. 2020, the year that was 2020, coronavirus, COVID. Obviously, we're coming out of that. But on top of that, you know, we had you know all these movements um, surrounding Black Lives Matter and just racial injustice in this country that people of color in America understand has been going on forever. But for whatever mm -hmm. reason, there's certain you know it, a lot of people turn a blind eye to it, and I think just everyone being at home nothing else to do but just be on media and like watching things you know like in the death of george floyd like and brianna taylor and just everything that's been going on in last year like really you know created this even bigger movement that led you to establishing ride for black lives um which for anyone that doesn't know ride for black mm -hmm. lives based here in la community of uh people you know riding bicycles but just for a good cause to create community to create unity to spark conversation to get people outdoors at the end of the day but Walk us through just like what th what that meant to you and, and how the idea originated. Man, so this is a it's a pretty crazy one because like I didn't I didn't think Ride for Black Lives would be what it is now, and not to say that it's something like incredibly huge, but like um, it's impactful. And to be honest, like there's a long backstory that started this. So. Um, Essentially, in 2019, I moved to Chicago to run social and content for a mortgage company, one of the larger mortgage companies in America. <clears throat> and um, so I led that team. Da -da. Um, COVID hit. I moved back to L.A. Like, because we were in the house anyways. Um, and, like, there was family stuff going on, so I wanted to be home so I could be close. And we weren't going to the office. We're still not going to office, whatever, right? Um, and then, um, everything hits the fan with, you know, like just how our, our United States of America is set up and like, you know, the systemic racism and like, the, like people getting killed on TV, like just blatantly by people who are supposed to protect them. Um, and on, on, on and on and on, like so many things. Right. Um, and, um, so, like, with all that being said, like, you know, at the company, we were, like, still talking about, like, low rates and, like, get your mortgages now and da, da, da. And I'm, like, yo, like, we sound deaf right now because, like, there's way more important things going on than, like, how low the mortgage rates are right now. People are dying. People are getting killed. Um, like, so, like, let's, let's be, let's take, like, a more wholesome approach and understand, like, how we can, like, help the community and, like, um, whatever. So like, you know, we did some stuff and then when it came to like the George Floyd situation and like the where everyone just stopped and um, and I, uh, you know, brought it up to the company and we had some back and forths and, you know, uh, we kind of we kind of did something, but we it wasn't right. And then we did something else and we and um and I got a post up and I, you know, wrote the copy and then uh, we, put, we put hashtag Black Lives Matter on that. And like some of our superiors at the company like called me going crazy on me, like pissed off that we wrote that. And I was like, well, we got approved. What are you talking about? And uh, 
They're like, yeah, but we don't, you know, we don't support political parties and da 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 da. And I'm like, I don't know, like, you know, black people being killed by cops is clearly not a political party. So the idea that Black Lives Matter is what we're talking about. Not necessarily saying that we're associating the company with, you know, um, the Black Lives Matter organization, but the the phrase and the term Black Lives Matter means so much more for a lot of people, and um, and like that turned into like a that turned into like an hour long debate with myself and the CMO and the CEO about like all this shit. So, you know, at that point, I was kind of like defeated and like upset, very angry, just because all kinds of things. And then to have this conversation with them was just like, that's crazy. Um, and for them to question like what I was, my intent, right? So like, you know, I think you know me by now. Like I definitely, wor- I definitely move in a, in a, you know, a, the utmost way possible every time. Um, and um, so, and I vetted what we did with so many people, so many CMOs, so many CEOs, so many directors of social that I know at all these brands and all these big conglomerates and companies. Um, so it's not like I was ill-informed, right? So um, yeah, like that just kind of like blew up in my face at work. So I was kind of like upset with them. They were upset with me. And like, for me, it was like, yo, like if you're upset about this, this shows me how you guys feel. and. If I can't use, if like our company's not gonna talk and like stand up for our community, I have to do so in some other way. And that other way was Ride for Black Lives. And it was like, I was, I went to my buddy Gio's spot and I had been riding my bike again since quarantine because the streets were empty and he had been riding his bike a little bit too and wanted to get a like an actual road bike. And I was like, yo, like, how about we do a ride? Um, and he's like, yo, we can start to ride at um, the burger shop and like, you know, whatever. And I was like, cool, like tight. And on that Thursday, um, on that Thursday, um, we, I just went home. I, you know, thought of the name and I put the asset together and we posted it. And on Monday we did our first ride and we had like 250 people show up. And that was crazy because like, I don't, I didn't know anyone that was like a serious cyclist like that before last year. So we're thinking like, oh, there'd be 10 of our actual friends there and we'll call it a day and we'll eat some burgers after. But it, it, uh, it was received pretty well. And I think, you know, again, it's like, you know, the, it's like the, um, timing and location of everything. And that's how, how everything works out. So like the goal was to just like understand that. There's some fucked up shit going on, and the media is portraying people in a bad light who want good. You know what I'm saying? So, like, the protests and all that, like, you know, the media didn't do, I don't feel like the media did a great job at, like, like really, like, conveying the message. Like, they took it and, like, made it into something that would, like, be exciting. And, like, this shit is not exciting. You know, like, so, like, our thing was just, like, yo, like, we want to do, like, this peaceful situation to where, like, no media outlet, no one else ever can ever say anything bad about us. And we want this to be a safe place for people to, like, lift their voice or, like, be a part of the movement. Um, And also for us to continue the message in a positive way through the streets of L.A. Um, and, um, And, like, you know, with COVID in mind, like, the bike kind of gives everyone a separate, you know, like some space because you have to have space in between each other, but also is working on your fitness, like your physical health, right? So like the idea of like you becoming more physically fit helps you against COVID as well too, right? So like your respiratory system, if it's not as strong, you can work on that while you're riding your bike. And, um, and also like your mental health, like Get out the house, enjoy the sun, enjoy the wind, move your body, like, you know, see people and be around people and understand that we're all here for, you know, so many of the same purposes. Um, So that's kind of like how Ride for Black Lives started, man. And it just continues to develop from there. Yeah. 
No, it's a beautiful thing. And I always see your story like on Instagram, even when you don't have an organized ride, you're always out on the street. Like you're going out for two hour bike rides around LA, like 50 miles. I'm like, damn, like I was guy riding 50 yeah. miles. That's insane. But no, it's, it's a beautiful thing. And just spreading, you know, the message and, and getting your point across and, and just in a, in a healthy and peaceful way, as you mentioned, like and getting people outdoors is I think key and just working on their, their mind and body and spirit, you know? Um, but yeah, thank man. you ron for everything for, sure, for this first half you know we're wrapping up last thing before we move on to your five pieces of content that you brought to share with all of us uh, what are some your, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, what, what are some of your goals that you're you know you have a lot going on as as we've covered but like what are some of your goals uh you know for for your career in, in the short term or long term um i mean to be honest like my goals have shifted a lot in the past year. And honestly, the biggest goal for me is just to impact my community as much as I can and do as much as I can for others. Um, at this point, I'm kind of like not really worried about my career success. Like that's going to come if it comes, if it doesn't, it does, right? So like my focus now is just like is doing as much as I can for other people um, because at the end of the day, like that's more empowering and more uh, fulfilling um so i mean uh, the goal is to keep the ride alive keep the message alive um positively impact you know the community around us and communities abroad as much as we can um and like just like kind of like help people get through some of these times and like also maybe help some people really understand the message and understand the idea that we're you know riding for on a regular weekly basis um, and hopefully, you know, if we spark an idea of change in someone who maybe didn't care about the message and now they do, like, hopefully, you know, I did my part. Um, and we as a community did our part together. So honestly, that's my biggest goal, man. Like, you know, live a healthy life, you know, I, you know, filled with, you know, like my thing is just like I've shot so much stuff like with photos and I've done so many things. I've been able to travel, but like, um, and like, you know, do cool things. But again, my focus now is just like community and building it up as much as possible and leaving that community as, as, you know, better, hopefully, um, than I found it for, you know, the next generation, my little brother and my little sister and my, um, my kids in the future, right? So like, that's my focus. Those are the goals for me. They're pretty simple. Yeah, of course. And classic, humbled, Ron response. We'd love to hear it. Thank you so much, man. Uh, but we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back uh, with some of Ron's work. So let's cut to that now. All right, so we're back here. Ron brought some great projects that he's been a part of throughout his career. And starting off with the first one, we have a couple photos that you brought to share of Nipsey Hussle, the late great, and we're filming this on April 2nd. His two year anniversary of his passing was on March 31st, the rest in peace and Lipsy. But um, yeah, it just I think in the moment, just very timely to talk about it. So walk us through a little bit about this project and what it was for and how it came about. Yeah, so there's a there's a I got a friend. His name is Lance Fresh. Some some people may know him from all kinds of things, but he was at Bleacher Report at the moment at that time when we shot and um, we had developed a cool, creative and friendly relationship where Whenever they were doing stuff in LA, they, he would, you know, reach out to me and um, and like bring me on board, which was always a blessing, always a good time. And um, in this particular project, it was uh, I think the series they called it like "Finish the Lyric" or something. So what they did w was like they would bring uh, like a musician and a and a and a athlete on with Lance and like they would talk and they, you know, talk about their life and their experiences and all that stuff, which was tight. Cause like you really got to see like, like uh, really in depth, like conversations and like people opened up a lot, which was cool. Um, and then it got fun where like the artist would have to finish the lyrics of the, I mean, the athlete would have to finish the lyrics of the artist. So for instance, like here it was uh, Isaiah Thomas, and Nipsey Hussle and IT was like a big he's a big Nipsey fan like and he's always been he expressed that and he's always been a big supporter and I'm sure people that know IT or Nipsey know have seen that so it was cool because like there was like 
a, a good there was a, a a pretty solid bond before and like and I think IT was on the Lakers at that point and and um and Nipsey pulled up with his Sacramento King jersey he was like I had to bring your regular like your original jersey um but he had already had it he was wearing it you know it was cool it was like cool like that and um, we shot it at the Marathon store before they opened the new one. So it was like the, the original one. Um, and um, it was a good vibe, man. Like it was just, you know, good people, good conversation. The project was super tight. Um, but it's just like, for me, like, this is why I, I guess, like photography. Because like you never know what you're going to capture, right? And like I think one of the photos I showed you was um, it and Nipsey. I think it's Adam outside the the outside the marathon. And like when you really, for me personally, when I think about it, it's like man, I was in Chicago when when the whole situation happened. And it's like fuck, like and the, it's immediately I remember just sitting out there with them taking photos in that same spot where all this tragedy just happened. And um, and um, it's interesting to like really like capture energy. Like there's a night they got like the energy in the photo is cool because like it's not like it's like a billboard photo or anything. Like this was like a side photo from the actual project. These were the actual project photos and like, but you see the essence and the energy and the enjoyment and the smile in their fa in everyone's faces at the time enjoying themselves. And for me, that's what matters the most when it comes to like taking photos or like being creative it's like capturing some in, like capturing the energy in that space capturing the aura of those humans um and kind of like translating that so that you know um you can potentially feel it when you see the photo and like i feel like this photo is just you know they were having a good time we were all having a good time and it was a good moment to capture and like for me personally it's like you know, look back on these photos of like, man, you know, being able to like just be around some of these people that have been influential in our communities in different industries and have done a lot for other people and to be able to like capture some images and like, you know, be able to keep those as keepsakes even just for myself, right? And understand that like, you know, like keeping every photo, every video, you know, these things like keep people alive in some shape or form, you know, um, especially after they're, pa they're gone. So like, it's unfortunate that he's, he was gone so soon, but, um, and every, and there's so many people have been touched by him. And, you know, um, for me, it's just always been an impactful, like moment that was captured there, understanding what actually happened the last time he was physically there. So for me, it kind of like hits, hits home a little bit. Um, and like, you know, and I'm sure it does for a lot of people. So that's kind of that's kind of why I like that photo a lot, man. You know. Yeah. No. And like you said, I think you did a great job of just capturing the the aura and the energy and just the livelihood of them in in this photo. And walk us through a little bit of your like approach stylistically, as far as like you know how how you go about you know working with celebrities such as this and like what what you hope to take away from from them and yeah, deliver. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because like like I said before, like I was kind of thrust into like shooting with you know big clients or big individuals right early on so like i kind of was always like used to like working with you know people like you kind of i feel like at the end of the day humans are humans regardless of how you know big or small they are in the public eye right and like again being a good human makes everything easier right so like if you come in you know i always come to a set i'm a confident but also humble understanding that like just so that everyone knows that like um i'm not gonna be in your way but i also know what i'm doing so like i'm gonna take input from you you take input from me and then we work together and we come out with something good so like um i've always you know been able to like be pretty personable with people when you know we start a shoot you got to get people you know comfortable um Especially like even to get some of the because I just showed you guys the behind the scenes like so like that's more telling of the comfortability of the of the shoot than the photos for the project you know what I'm saying and that's why I like this photo these kind of photos because like um, 
if you can make people feel comfortable with you around, then you can capture these moments where they have their guard down and you can see who they really are, right? And um, and um, because like you think about it, like a lot of not to say that Nipsey doesn't smile a lot, but so, most of his posed photos are not like overly smiling, right? And all of his photos of him enjoying himself and smiling and laughing were usually taken by people that were close and he and he was in a comfortable situation. So that's always my approach to like be like there and present, but as like still with like the fly on the wall kind of vibe and like part of the scene as opposed to like the photographer with the big camera who's like doing a lot and telling people to do it. Because the other part is like once you start directing people too much you know then you, it's not it's not as natural um so like that's kind of the approach here like everyone was cool i knew people already before so that helped as well and like i always tell people it's just like yo like just do your thing and i'm gonna shoot it and trust me like you not worrying about me taking photos and me not worrying about telling you what to do is going to make the perfect um moment so like that's kind of was my approach here on this one obviously this this actual photo though is like the photo I shot in this weird angle because there was cars parked in the parking lot and I wanted to get the marathon sign and I wanted to get them in it. So like, obviously I had to like tell them to come over there, but the, some of the other photos were just us just sitting outside or in the, in the store, like just capturing and having a good time. Yeah. And I, I love that point too. Thank you for sharing that because I think one thing about being a creative photographer, videographer is being a problem solver, finding solutions on the whim, you know, and I think that that translates really well into just your regular everyday life. You can't, you know, dwell too much on one thing because not, not everything is going to be perfect come the day of the shoot. Like there's always things that go wrong. Like so the lighting's weird, the weather's weird, whatever. So just being, being able to be quick on your feet. Something's late, the food's not there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Or like the talent might be having a terrible day and they just really don't even want a camera in their face, but just being personable, being, you know, like allowing them to give them their space by still doing your thing, I think is really um, important. So I think that's a really key takeaway aside from these photos being great, but it's amazing. Uh, Thank you, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. No doubt. All right, moving on to the second piece of content here. We have Salehi Bembury, who is now at Versace, if I'm not mistaken, if that's correct. Uh, just does a lot of creative stuff. Yeah, he... he uh, Go ahead. He left Versace this year. Got gotcha. you. Okay. He, he, you know, he... He, uh, he won... He was designer of the year last year. And... If you don't know Salehi, you would know him by, he was, uh, he's been all over. Like he did, you know, some stuff at Payless and then he did first couple of seasons of Yeezy footwear. And then he went to Versace and did like, um, you know, kind of like put them on the map with their shoe and like bringing in like people like 2 Chains to help like push that energy, like, like really connecting the dots. Like he really grew there, obviously. Um, and made a big name for himself, but he's like super creative dude, super cool dude. I met him actually at Ride for Black Lives, like randomly. Um, I didn't know him before Ride for Black Lives, and like he started just showing up, and he he comes to every single ride, and um, super supportive, super like always down to help, and like do it without needing any like you know uh, recognition or anything. Um, so like. We, uh, and then we, again, we just connected there and, you know, he was doing some stuff and he was going solo and doing like his new balance and all that. And, um, we were just chopping up and he was like, yo, like, like, let's just, uh, I got to do a couple of things. You mind like, you want to do some, you know, some shoots with me? I was like, cool. So again, like we, I went over to his studio, his office with him and like, we just hung out and chilled and like, um, and like I captured, I think I have a photo of him with the shoe in front of the computer. And um, we had a long conversation of like the photos he likes and the photos he doesn't like. Cause like he's always seen, yeah, that he's always seen with his beanie on, obviously, but like usually like not smiling. And there's some other photos that I didn't s send cause like whatever, but like there's, there's a, um, there's a, uh, it was a good, like, I think it was a good representation too. Cause like the other thing for me is, uh, I don't like 
for my creative work to be perfect. Like, I feel like the idea of tracing perfection kind of like gets in the way. So like, even on his screen, it only says his name. There's nothing on his screen. And I like that because like, that's real. Like we were in the space and capturing that moment, not like setting shit up, right? And like, I love, I love all of my work to be as organic and like true to the time that I captured it as possible. And like literally he was on the computer and then I was like, yo, turn around and hold the, the, and look, cause like he had this light coming from his window, which was tight. And then we just started snapping some shots. And then he was like, he's like, oh, dang, the screen just went off. And I was like, nah, it's perfect. It's fine. It says your name. And like, it's natural. Like that's everyone's screen goes off at some point. So there's no need to like set it up. Like you're on the computer when you're not. Um, so these are coming some of the things that I like to like implement in my style where like if you look at all my photos, like there's something off and like sometimes I'll leave it there on purpose just just so you can see that like it doesn't need to be perfect. It still works like you still get the same experience um, and it's true to like what's going on with that person or that scenario. Um, so it's good. And again, like for me, like I th it's been a blessing to be able to like you know, document history. Like when you think about, for instance, like my favorite photographer when I started like really diving into photography was is Julius Shulman. Julius Shulman is the architectural photographer. I don't shoot architecture at all. But so it's interesting for me to be like my biggest, like, you know, whatever, like, the person I put on the pedestal of photography is Julia Schulman. And I think that helps me too, because like I I studied his work a lot and understand the structure, right? And like lines and depth and scale. And for anyone that's trying to learn or like understand photography, go look up Julia Schulman. It'll help you. It'll help you a lot actually when it comes to like framing and composition and understanding like where like where to really hit your angles um that's another deep conversation but um but um but um yeah man i mean like for me it's just like i know how to compose and i'd rather just like capture a natural moment and um and like kind of capture like these things that these moments that'll last forever you know um and for these people all over you know all the people that i've shot like you know, being able to document and like carry their legacy on and like exude their energy and emotion. Um, I think it's just something cool about that for you to be able to do that and like have a good time doing it and, you know, maybe pay your bills on it as well. Like that's super tight. You can't, you can't go wrong with that, you know? Yeah. And I love how you guys connected just on some super, like just something you guys were both passionate about, you know, it wasn't even like, you know, let's, let's try to connect for a business purpose or whatever. It was literally like, two people doing something that they love because it was like something they're passionate about. And it's like, oh, we also do this, that, and we can work together. You know, it wasn't like, it's not as exactly. forced or anything. Um, something that I wanted to- Being a good human being. Exactly, yes. There you go. Doing things that you love, being a good person goes far. Um, you mentioned that, you know, you, you don't like your, your, your photos or your final images to be perfect, you know, and it's, it's very much just like, this is a moment and I'm capturing it. So. How does your preparation for a shoot like such as this like lead to that? Is it is it like you kind of just know what you're doing, what you're supposed to be capturing, and then so you show up and then you do it, or like well, yeah, what is walk us through your preparation for for everything? I guess it it depends because like obviously like if I'm going to shoot something for Nike or like a, like a like a big brand or big client, like there's weeks upon weeks of calls and brainstorming and shot lists and goals and blah blah blah, you know and lighting tests and all this thing right so like those shoots are like very structured and for a reason obviously and whenever i have the chance for it not to be as structured as that i take that advantage of that because i feel again like the idea of like that structure sometimes constrains and boxes the creativity and just the feeling and the vibe for everybody um so like when I'm doing like smaller shoots that like I and like maybe one other person has full creative control, like 
I like to like set set the table with everyone and be like, yo, like, just don't worry about it. Like, don't stress over it. Don't stress me out because I also still want to have fun doing this because I've done enough like work work with photography to like where sometimes I felt like photography wasn't fun anymore. So like when I started to like feel like that, I uh, definitely put my foot down sometimes and just like, you know, just tell people not to overthink things and like let us just flow. So like for him, it wasn't like it wasn't anything crazy. It was just like, you know, we needed some photos that kind of like, they're photos of him, but they allude to what's to come. So the new balance and like, you'll see on his desk, there's um, some other elements that like made sense, which were kind of already there. Um, but like, it was like this idea of like, cool, let me come to the office and I'll just see what it looks like for the first time. And then I'll know what I need to capture. Like, there's no need to like put a storyboard together, a mood board, some shit. Like, you know, cause like whatever you put on a mood board was done and shot in some other place that you're not even gonna be in. So it's kind of defeats the purpose. Cause you, cause like the idea, you know, like your expectations sometimes will be your disappointments. So like, that's, that's also true in creativity. Um, and you gotta be willing to like flow and adjust and, you know, and, and be nimble. Um, and that's the beauty of creativity. Cause like, you know, you can do, you can solve a problem all the time with your mind, um, and your tools by like just showing up and like being ready to go. So like, that's kind of, that's those that was the approach on this one to be honest. It was just like, yo, like I just wanted a couple photos of me and I want the stuff that I'm working on in the next couple months to be in it. Boom. There you go. Well, all your accolades are on the wall. This is where you spend ninety five percent of your time at your desk working on shit. And um and like let's use this nice little light to like kind of just like highlight your face a little bit. And that's I mean, like, that's a faux pas in itself. Like, like the light on his face isn't the same as the light everywhere else. But I liked it because it was more about him, right? And everything else is, like, a little darker, but you're looking at him. So, like, and that was the focus. So I think those kind of, like, natural, like, contrasts and those natural imperfections, like, you know, are super tight. For my style, at least, you know? Yeah, fully agreed. No, and, and I mean... It goes without saying, like, look at the photo. It's it's great. So yeah, they kill this for sure. I have to ask. I have to ask because I know someone in the comments is going to be like, "What kind of camera does he use?" But I personally don't subscribe to like you need to shoot on a certain camera. But walk us through your setup. You know, what are you shooting on usually? Man, I hate that question. Yeah, same. <laughs> All right, I have a, I have a, I have a, I get it. Like you know, but whatever. I have a. 5D Mark III that I've had since 2014. Sick. And that's it. That's all you need to know. Moving on. <laughs> <laughs> all right, moving right along to the third piece of content. Uh, we have Bubba and the Migos, the NASCAR race. Oh, yeah. Walk us through yeah. the walk, this is Yeah, I, I love it, man. There's so much energy in these photos, and it's just like the Migos at a NASCAR race. You're just like rapping NASCAR, two things you really think of going hand in hand. So just tell us how this came about. Yeah, man. Well, like, um, again, I was referred by a good friend to another friend that like, hey, we need a photographer. We're trying to do something new with NASCAR. We're trying to bring some different energy to it. And we want someone to like, understands how to like capture that content and that energy um so boom they hit me up it was tight because like i love cars like i love automotive everything um so for me to be able to like go to the nascar race go on the track like go in the pits like all that and like capture this moment like was like really big for me but also it was big for like culture in itself right because like you know, you got Bubba Wallace, who is, um, you know, just breaking barriers as a NASCAR racer. And this is, I think, mean, what was this, 2018, I think, I was over there. That was when we did this. So, like, you know, that's a few years ago. Not, like, he was a big topic this past year. 
too. But like he's been doing this before this. And I was lucky enough to be able to be there and capture it. Like, and so like then I have like Migos come. Like there was more people there too. There was like Ice Cube came and like um, um, uh, so a group of other people. Like there was, I shot with like at least 10 other like celebrities that came through the space. But for me, having Migos and Bubba Wallace at the beginning of a NASCAR race and like being all up in there and like just with their energy and everyone, like kind of just like embracing the moment of like, yo, like this is cool. This is strides for like, you know, America. This is strides for sports. This is strides for, you know, people of color for us to be like here on this stage. Um, and, um, you know, me and, you know, again, like I said, like it's, for me, it's tight to be able to capture like history. Like, I feel like not that it's like, you know, it's not like a presidential inauguration, but like shooting with Migos and a black NASCAR racer at NASCAR is like a big deal. Like never really seen it before like that. So, like, for me to be able to be there and for, like, a brand like NASCAR to trust me to, like, do some, you know, to capture the the moment and for these guys to be comfortable with, you know, again, taking photos in a space where there's a lot going on um, was tight. And, like, for me, again, like, it brings together so many worlds. And I love music. My family's been deep in music. I love cars. It's all automotive racing and, like, to be there and capture it. The energy at a NASCAR race is crazy. Um, and then like, you know, fast forward this past year where Bubba Wallace was like a big, you know, talk with like what was going on at NASCAR. And like now Michael Jordan has a team with Denny Hamlin and him, like, again, like continuing to push the envelope, but him being in the space wasn't that big of a deal back in 2018. So like, you know, more like, so this year, this past year brought a lot of awareness to his situation, but he's been putting in this work and like kind of paving the way for um, a little, a more diverse look and feel for like an industry that has, you know, lacked in the, in the department of diversity. So for me, like, I think it's pretty cool to be able to have been there, captured it. And, and again, for this, like, you know, I got, I was, had to be introduced to the, the racers by you know the, the drivers um and then i would be introduced by the artists or the celebrities or the actors who came through and you'd be like yo ron series gonna take photos and like again i would just be like yo you guys just do whatever you guys want to do i'm just gonna capture it we'll pose we'll stop and like take a couple like photos so that you know we're looking at the camera but after that like just do your thing because I'm just going to capture you guys as natural as possible. You can see, like, they were having a great time. And, like, the less you get in, in the way of people having a good time, the more you will get out of them. So it's just like – and, like, the, the again, the more – they get more comfortable with you where it's like, you know, you're, you're not being annoying. You're not being pushy. You're not, like, aggravating. You're just there with them in the moment. And you get to, like, see some of, like, you know, see some of that come through the photos. So I think it was tight. I had a great time. That was an amazing experience. I thought it was an amazing effort for NASCAR to like bring those worlds there too. So it was pretty cool, man. Yeah. What, uh, photography aside, working aside, like what was your favorite part of like the day or just like the whole experience? Man, my favorite part, I, I don't exactly remember like the conversation, but like when Migos, when the Migos and Bubba were at his car pre-race. There was like this, uh, there was this like commentator or announcer that was live on whatever channel that was covering the race. And like, he was so excited to go talk to them. And like, he like kind of knew them. And then they started talking about like, you know, they said something and they were like, yeah, then you got a dab on them. And he was like, dab on them, what's that? And it was just like this like culmination of like, uh, uh, cultures colliding and like and like learning from each other and like enjoying each other like people that don't know each other at all coming from different walks of life in one space to like and like all enjoying it and like doing it in, in, in 
good fun and fashion it was super tight to like experience it and see like i think like i hope i hope but i think like a lot of the people that were there that day it like maybe opened their eyes a little bit more to like the opp the possibilities of our communities and our backgrounds like being closer to one than they were before you know what i'm saying so i feel for, for me that was tight to like see just you know nascar is a different nascar is a different culture so like to see these cultures collide for me that was the biggest thing it's just like this is tight like i'm here for it and i'm capturing it all and like it's an amazing time it's amazing uh point of view to see see this thing happening moving right along to the fourth piece of content we have some of your ecom photos for your line love you so we talked a little bit about it in the first in the first half but yeah man just walk us through like what you hope to accomplish through through your line and, and what you want to what you want to do with it moving forward is if i can you know again like i think it's for me the goal is just like a, it's like kind of like a creative hug that i want to create every time so like when you receive a piece when you buy a piece when you see a piece like it's like nice like it's a nice warm you know feeling that you get and also like and also like i also want to show people that like you can you know execute your passion and it doesn't need to be like an overproduced situation you know what i'm saying like i do minimal work on this for a reason because like a i don't need to like i don't want to like you know like act like this is a huge brand. Like it's not fear of God. It's not Givenchy. This is like this is just me making some stuff every now and then, right? And like I think there's, I think there's power in that message too, because I want other people to be able to see like like yo, you, if you want to make something and put it out there, you can like, and you can do it all within your boundaries and all within your resources and access, you know, and um. And that's kind of like the story of the brand where like it's just this super organic it flows how it how and whenever if it, it can or will um i don't go by seasons i just go by uh, you know pieces and inspiration so like i remember before i did i went to japan maybe a few years ago and um and um and i was so inspired because it's my first time being there and like so i went to tokyo it was super tight i had a great time um i love it i can't wait to go back one day and i snapped a couple photos and like i did like a tokyo hoodie from my experience there so i like i captured a photo i printed on the hoodie i like um you know made it you know make sense for like that vibe and like it's again like i just make pieces when i get inspired and like this piece was inspired by like everything that's been going on this past year and a half where like there's just so much fucking fighting and like hurt and anguish and hate and all this shit and like to be honest like for me the message is you know pretty simple like i want i just want every human being to be loved happy and free and when you really think about it it's it's crazy because like what is what is any confrontation fighting for usually it's either for freedom um or for something that they want for themselves to be happy right um or like you know maybe they don't feel loved and like someone hates them so now that you know this is like the situation where like if everyone felt loved happy and free like maybe our world would be like a little bit better um and like those three things are free like they don't cost money everyone should be free everyone needs love and like everyone wants to be happy so like you know i don't know again hopefully that message maybe touches someone um somewhere and inspires them to like make sure that they you know do their their part to make sure people are loved and free and happy um and um and you know that's 
that's the message I want to continue to spread. So hopefully it spreads, you know? Yeah, no doubt. And I think that message in itself is really what attracted me to your product. Aside from like, it's you and I know you and like we've met, and, but you know, I know a lot of people who also have clothing lines, but I'm not trying to buy their shirt cause it's like garbage, you know what I mean? But just with you, it's just like, I, I love the name of it. Just love you so is already beautiful in itself. But then even the messaging behind it, I just want every human being to be loved, happy and free. Like. I was like, wow, that's crazy. And like, even wearing this shirt, like people around, like when I'm walking around, they'll be like, oh, I really like that, you know? So uh, I don't think you touched upon it, but like, yeah. how did how did you decide on that message or how did it come up for you to use? Literally like one night I thought of like, I was just, I, I as a creative, you know, sometimes things just hit you in the face. And like, and like, I was like, sometimes I'll just write in my notebook, just random things and like, I feel like I was on the computer and the TV was on and like things were going on. And I was like, and like in my, I just said it to myself, like everyone should just be loved, happy and free. And like everybody would be fine. And then I wrote it down a couple times. And I'm like, damn, that's a pretty powerful message for love you. So that's what love you. So is at the end of the day. Um, so like literally, yeah, one day I just, it just, I was writing, all kinds of weird stuff in the notebook and like that I wrote it like four or five times I was like man that sounds powerful especially like right now um just because like it kind of you know like it's it's like again last year was a fucking crazy year and we're still dealing with the repercussions of this past year right but like there's so much and luck I mean it's weird too because like COVID sucks and I don't wish that on anyone, but, you know, if you go back in life, so many things happen and, and the universe makes things happen how and when it's supposed to. And like, unfortunately, it took a global pandemic for our glo uh, globally for all of us to understand, like, there's so much bullshit going on and hate and, and, and you know, um, terror and just like all kinds of weird things and like. For me, it was like a message that kind of encapsulated everything that was going on last year. Um, and I think it's a message that should be taken into the future, understanding that, like, I know it sounds simple, but life is, it can be simple if we want it to be. And that message is simple enough to where, like, if you live by that, like, no one would ever have a problem with you. If you wanted, if you genuinely wanted everyone to be, you know, loved, happy, and free, and you treated everyone as such, like, how would you have a problem, you know? Beautifully said, man. And for anyone that wants to check out Love You So, we'll put the link in the description. Pre-orders will likely be closed. You know, you yeah. just have to wait for the next drop. But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, go, oh, ch go check them out oh, and yeah. stay, stay in touch. Yeah, for small business always. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. My name is Ron Holden. I am American History. I created Ride for Black Lives because all I saw in the media last year was uh, negative energy and negative energy towards like groups of people trying to make positive moves. I wanted to create this space for other people to want to participate in the movement and also this safe space to continue the message in a super positive way. Our goal is to never let the conversation die um, and I just hope that from an outsider's point of view we can inspire some people to keep going and keep fighting and keep moving through their life knowing that people do support them and do care about their livelihood. Some people ask like yo like why are we riding so long early on why are we riding like so far 25 miles and da 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 this is so tough. And, and like a couple people started to like bring that up a lot. I pulled them to the side and these are people I didn't know at the time. And I'm like, you know, I hear you like cycling is not easy, but this pain that we're feeling is nothing compared to the pain that all these individuals being killed on TV are feeling at the moment or the pain that their families are dealing with, seeing that or witnessing it or fighting to get justice for their family. Um, 
So when you really step back and like think about what what's really going on, like the pain in your legs from riding your bike for 10 miles, it doesn't compare at all to the pain that people feel uh, in uh, dealing with some of these things that that have sparked the birth of our community and like what we're trying to do. This piece was super tight. Um, it was a, it was a joy working with um, with um, Lululemon, Christina, who like approached me about the job uh, about the project. Who's been putting in a lot of work for Lululemon here in the community, um, and working with JJ and Tito from the production company who shot all the video and put it all together, and Halo who did some of the photos. It was um, and Halo like I met. I met Halo on the ride. He started coming to Ride for Black Lives before this project even happened. So it was tight to like see those circles and worlds, you know, collide. Um, and it was again, it was a part of like this Black History Month celebration. It was like a virtual thing they did, and um, it was a, uh, it was a, um, it was like a big, it was a bigger thing than just this video. Like there was all kinds of things that were going on, all kinds of amazing people doing amazing things for the community. So I was definitely blessed and humbled for Ride for Black Lives to be thought about as being part of, you know, as much good as everyone else is doing. Um, so it was cool, man. Like I enjoyed doing that. And it was like, it kind of like the video kind of, it kind of helped us kind of maybe paint the picture of like what our goals are and the goals for Ride for Black Lives is it's a first and foremost, it's a peaceful ride with a peaceful message of love and unity. The goal is to, you know, uh, continue the conversation, understanding that like racial injustice, racism in itself, um, social equality, just we need to talk about it more. We need to understand what's going on. Um, B, we wanted people to be active and feel comfortable in the world of cycling because cycling itself has been somewhat of an elitist sport, high barrier of entry. So some people don't feel comfortable even jumping in or like trying to ride with people or whatever. So we wanted to kind of like bridge that gap, which we do on all of our rides because like every bike is welcome. It doesn't matter how long you've ridden before or whatever. Like we do like 25 mile rides, 13 mile rides. It's doable for everybody. We welcome every single person, you know, regardless of what bike you're on, where you come from. And then the biggest goal is to, you know, create habitual community participation, meaning like our goals are to like, you know, help push the youth forward in cycling, but, you know, in every way possible, supporting small business of color, especially during COVID because it's like, you know, everything's locked down how can these businesses stay afloat well our goal is to try to like bring some energy to them bring some revenue to them bring some awareness so that people knew where they, they work you know like without that knowledge you just wouldn't be there and then who knows if that business would be there you know in five months right so like our goal is to just like always do as much as we can we did you know boating rides we made it we made it so that people felt comfortable going to the polls and dropping off their ballots uh, We've donated a couple bikes. Uh, we, you know, raised some money for food drives. So, like, our goal is to just like impact the community as much as possible in a positive way, um, and making people feel comfortable in doing so, and all with the message and in, in the name of the ride in itself speaks for itself. It's ride for Black Lives. It's the idea that like, you know, there's a lot of change that needs to be done happen. I mean, and um, and as a community, as we move together and support each other, like inevitably, if we do that more, the better off we are, right? Um, it's cultivated so many like friendships and like business opportunities and like just genuine connections that I've seen. And like, it's like pushed people into like being more healthy and more, you know, conscious of their you know, physical and mental health. Um, and, you know, it, it, I feel like it helped a lot of people get through such a tough year. Um, so for all those reasons, I'm super humbled and 
and super excited that we've been able to like do what we can physically um, for the community around us. And we hope to keep it going and hope to help hopefully, you know, broaden our reach um, outside of Los Angeles as well. So it's been an amazing journey, super organic. Like I said, I didn't think, I didn't, honestly, I didn't know what this would be. I never led a group ride before, uh, before this ride. And like, you know, we just wanted to do something for, if we helped one person feel better about the year or we helped spark an idea of change for someone in the community that saw us riding through, like, Hopefully we're doing as much as we can to like help change, you know? Yeah, man, no doubt. And it's been inspiring me, ju inspiring just as an onlooker and seeing everything that you've been accomplishing and just all stem from this one spark, this one idea that you had and originally just like, oh, let's see if maybe we get 10 people. And it turned out the first time was like over 250 plus, whatever. Crazy. Um, yeah. And, and you're, you're at, at the root of it, you're really, you're, you're starting a conversation at least, you know, you're, you're getting people talking. I'm doing it in, in a healthy way as well. And I commend you so much for, for doing that because it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing, man. But let the people know how, you know, if they want to come, if they're in LA, they want to come ride yeah, with you. Yeah, if you want to come. Does it happen? Uh, every, like, I, again, it's, I'm doing so much. So, like, I just do it as basic yeah. as possible. So, like, every week I'll post the ride schedules. Um and if you follow us, Ride for Black Lives, we usually ride every Saturday morning. Um, during the summer, we try to do a Saturday morning and a Monday evening ride. Um, if we ride downtown, it's usually 13 miles. If we ride on the west side, it's usually about 20 to 25 miles. Um, the website is rideforblacklives.org. Um, you can always shoot an email over if you have any questions, but easiest way to contact is Instagram ride for black lives. We post a schedule every week. We've been riding pretty much every week since June 8th of 2020. So our one year anniversary will be in June 8th, a couple months. Um, so yeah, we'll be here whenever you guys have the chance. Um, this, this ride won't die. So if you don't get a bike for four months, we'll still be riding and you can pull up in four months. If you want to ride this Saturday or next Saturday, we'll be here. So Epic, man. Perfect. What, what bike are you riding on? What's the recommendation? <laughs> man, well, I have a few bikes. You got, you got a couple behind you. I yeah. got a few bikes. I ride two bikes in particular. All City, which is a brand out of Minneapolis. It's a steel bike. I ride the Super Professional. They were, they were, uh, we were blessed enough for them to like, I was blessed enough for them to give me a bike. And we were blessed enough for them to be able to support the ride this year for us doing like some bike giveaways and stuff down the road this summer. So that's tight. And then I ride this Blackheart here, um, which is a brand that was birth, birthed here in Santa Monica. It's, it's, uh, it's a guy I know. His name is Zach. Um, so, you know, it's a titanium bike. It's super tight, kind of like an all road vibe. Um, so those are the two bikes I ride pretty much every day. They, they have their different purposes. Um, so if you all, if you have any bike questions or you, you want to want some help or also reach out too, we can, we can set you up and get you going in the right direction too. Perfect. Man. Yeah. And I'll leave all the links for all the ride for black lives contact info in the description below, but yeah, dude, Ron, thank you so much for your time. We've been on this call for an hour and a half. So if you made it to, to this, yeah, if, if you made it to the end, leave a hashtag love you so in the comments and whoever does that first i will the next time ron drops something i will personally buy it for you and send it your way if you made it this far hey. um, because, <laughs> and i might throw something is, extra for you hey epic yeah so there you go because this has been a very insightful conversation a long one so we really thank you for being here till the very end but ron just surround us out here um let us know you know you already dropped uh all the info for all your organizations, but if people want to get in contact with you directly, like how can they follow you? If they want to give you some work, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, like I don't update my work website. The last time I updated my photos on there was 2017. So you can email me, you can go to my website, holdingfocus.com. You can go to my Instagram, Ron Holden Jr. Um, and you know hit me up and then you can hit me up on love you so studios you can hit me up on ride for black lives either one i'm i'm gonna be and one of them at one point in the day so there's you got options
<laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Please, please follow Ron. He's he's a beast and just someone who will inspire your your journey as a person uh, in general. But yeah. thank you, thank you again, Ron. Uh, and we'll catch you all in the next one. Woo! Thank you. Peace. Let's go. Wow. Thank you, bro. Appreciate, Appreciate you. That, man. Man, sorry, that was a lengthy one.